Good evening. My name is Adam Milligan with Profound Medical. I want to welcome you to today's Pro Talk session, the fifth in an ongoing series. For our first time guests, Pro Talk is an educational platform for physicians by physicians, brought to you by Profound. Shortly, you'll be hearing from our members of our Profound Medical Leadership Team, as well as four medical experts in their respective fields. They will be presenting on their experience and opinions of the Tulsa Pro technology. Please note, we're going to hold all questions until the end of the presentations. Please use the Q&A function on your screen to get your question in the queue. And of course, a few disclaimers. The Tulsa Pro system is FDA cleared to ablate prostate tissue. All guest speakers' presentations reflect the medical views and experience of the physicians and are not attributable to Profound Medical. Now let's get started. I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Profound's Chief Medical or Chief Commercial Officer, Abby Goodman, sharing some corporate updates. It's good to see you, Abby. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our ProTalk webinar event. I'm very excited for what you're going to hear and what you will learn tonight. You'll hear from our Senior Vice President of Tulsa Pro with some clinical updates. You'll hear from our partners regarding real-world outcomes, um, patient selection, and the adoption of Tulsa. But I'm here to share some corporate updates and milestones that we are extremely excited about and feel like feel confident that they are going to be catalysts for the technology and for our partners. So what we've learned over these past few years is that our C code is working. It is working at a hospital outpatient setting, which we are very excited about, along with coverage of some of our private payer insurance companies. Additionally, we have applied to be on the ASC covered procedure list. And if that's approved, we will be effective January of 2024. One of the most exciting updates though, is that AMA has accepted the addition of three CPT category one codes for MRI monitored Tulsa, which should be effective January of 2025. We are so excited that this will open up the doors for more community hospitals, more academic universities, more settings for Tulsa to be offered to patients. The last piece that I'm very excited to share is that we are so confident in our technology and the clinical benefits that HIP brings to patients, we are going head to head against prostatectomy in our captain study. As you can see from the chart below, our hope is that in early 2025 will be our first publication, with our second publication coming in 2025, which will support the continued adoption of our technology. So we are very excited about these things. We hope you are too. And I hope you, you learn from our peers and partners um, what Tulsa can do for you and your patients. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Very exciting news. Next, we'll hear from our Senior Vice President of Tulsa Pro, Matthew Burtnick, who will be sharing interim five-year TAC data. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Abby, for sharing the milestones of the acceptance of the CPT codes for the Tulsa procedure. Not only does this anchor a reimbursement strategy and timeline, it demonstrates that the AMA determined the Tulsa procedure met all the requirements for a permanent code, including the TACT clinical trial, which was part of the file, which further validates the clinical data as well as the Tulsa procedure. In 2019, I had the distinction of sharing with the community our TACT pivotal trial one-year outcomes. It is my sincere pleasure to be here today and present to you the five-year outcomes of the seminal study, which demonstrate the stability and durability of the outcomes. It also sets the stage for a captain randomized trial comparing the Tulsa procedure to robotic radical prostatectomy, which is ongoing. The Tulsa Pro Ablation Clinical Trial, or the TAC trial, is an FDA pivotal study of the Tulsa procedure. It included 115 men across 13 sites in five countries. More than half the sites were in the United States at distinguished university teaching hospitals. 
The study population was a mainly intermediate risk prostate cancer population where whole gland ablation with urethral cooling and apical sparing was performed. Primary endpoints were PSA reduction and adverse events at one year, and these were published on the cover article of the March 2021 issue of the Journal of Urology. Secondary endpoints included a number of measures, prostate volume reduction, prostate biopsy, and multiparametric MRI at one year, as well as a number of quality of life instruments, adverse events, and progression-free survival to five years. Ablation efficacy to five years is stable and durable. PSA initially decreased from a median of 6.3 nanograms per milliliter to 0.53 nanograms per milliliter at one year. By five years, the median PSA is still very low at 0.63 nanograms per milliliter. In addition, the PSA nadir continued to decrease to 0.26 nanograms per milliliter, which compares nicely to other whole gland ablative established technologies. In terms of histological outcomes, these were based on one-year biopsy and have not changed, and there was no significant disease in 80% of the men based on ex extensive sampling with 10 cores in median 3cc residual prostate volumes. One-year prostate MRI demonstrated a prostate volume reduction of 92% uh, to 3cc in 12 months, as measured by Central Radiology Core Lab. Very interestingly, multiparametric MRI had a 94% negative predictive value for the absence of grade group 2 disease on one-year biopsy. In terms of progression-free survival, defined as progression to additional intervention for prostate cancer, uh, the TECT uh, study measured 21% of patients had additional intervention for prostate cancer by five years without unexpected complications. What is very interesting is that the proportion of men who progress to additional treatment is very similar to the clinically significant biopsy findings at one year. This is perhaps not surprising considering the high biopsy sampling rate, which likely picked up any of the important residual tissue. Together, the one-year biopsy and the one-year MRI show to be effective predictors of longer-term outcomes of progression-free survival. Putting some additional context on the progression-free survival with some uh, outcomes from radical prostatectomy. Uh, on the left, we showed the progression-free survival uh, in the TAC study after the Tulsa procedure. And important to note, this was a single Tulsa procedure and no second ablations were allowed per protocol. As mentioned, 21% of men had additional intervention by five years, and this was roughly split uh, between uh, radical prostate, salvage radical prostatectomy and salvage radiation therapy. On the right, we see the similar uh, data set for radical prostatectomy, looking at the pivot RCT, the capture database, uh, as well as propensity score weighted comparisons uh, of prostatectomy to ablation. We see that the rates of progression are similar uh, and ranging from about 16 uh, to 22% at five years. Tact safety and functional preservation is durable to five years. In terms of urinary continence, 97% of patients remain socially continent at five years. Um, and so that is patients uh, wearing one zero to one pad per day. 92% of patients were completely pad free. In terms of erectile function, 0% of patients uh, experienced severe erectile dysfunction where medication is not helpful. And 87% of patients at five years um, who were previously potent reported erection firmness sufficient for penetration after Tulsa. In terms of adverse events to five years, there have been no changes since the previously reported data set. Putting some additional context on urinary incontinence uh, and looking at radical prostatectomy, here we compare the outcomes in the TAC trial to those observed in the PIVOT study randomizing radical prostatectomy to observation as a control arm. Both the Tulsa procedure and radical prostatectomy produce an initial decline in function. However, with the Tulsa procedure, this function is returned at one year and stable to five years. Some of the slight decrease observed between one and five years after the Tulsa procedure is likely related to age-related progression. In summary, the tact five-year outcomes demonstrate the durability of the procedure. The 80% histological benefit is consistent with progression-free survival, likely due to the significant prostate volume reduction. In other words, if there's very little prostate tissue left, the odds of progression are low. This is the five-year follow-up of our pivotal regulatory study. This was the initial learning curve of 13 centers doing Tulsa for the first time. What we have seen since then is even more impressive with real-world data showing the comprehensiveness of the Tulsa procedure. 
No other established or emerging technology can safely and effectively prescribe treatment plans to ablate as many different prostate disease patients as Tulsa does. With the Tulsa Precision, you can adjust the treatment plan in real time. Real time temperature measurements and visualization allow for pixel by pixel accuracy, killing cancer cells and avoiding vital tissue. With Tulsa flexibility, you can design treatment plans of whole gland ablation or partial gland ablation, really customizing for what is best for the patient. With the transurethral directional ultrasound uh, source, this allows for the treatment of larger small prostates and with disease anywhere in the gland. Finally, Tulsa durability is demonstrated with these TACT five-year outcomes uh, with clinical data showing progression rates similar to that of prostatectomy but with better side effects. One-year outcome data can predict longer-term outcomes, which is important for patients undergoing prostate ablation. And with that, I'll turn it back to Adam, who will introduce our next speakers, from whom you will hear their real-world experience with Tulsa and see the outcomes they have produced, which, quite frankly, they're really the best prostate ablation outcomes seen in the U.S. population. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And now for what you really tuned in for, the expert panel. Joining us from the Lone Star State, from UT Southwest, please welcome Dr. Mang and Dr. Costa. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Matthew, for that uh, great introduction um, and a kind of summation of the TAC trial. Um, Daniel and I uh, are at UT Southwestern. I just want to kind of share with you guys a little bit of our experience here uh, through our clinical program after our participation in the TAC trial. So just to kind of quick review of the Tulsa Pro system, uh, as you can see here, it's composed of two different parts uh, inside the patient. One is a transurethral device, this ultrasound applicator that basically allows us to fire directional thermal ultrasound waves out from the device and it rotates 360 degrees, allowing us to treat uh, essentially anywhere within the prostate that's within the three centimeter margin, uh, as well as a rectal cooling device that cools the anterior surface of the rectum. Uh, additionally, from these two different devices, you can see that this is done in the MRI machine, so it's done within the MRI bore, um, which gives us kind of live thermometry images and the ability to really update kind of patient imaging morning of treatment. Um, so we're kind of dealing with the most up-to-date images. In terms of working up these patients uh, before Tulsa, um, you know, it kind of starts out with a review of the MRI and the pathology it really needs to have concordant um, pathology and MRI in the sense that if there is a lesion seen in imaging that's not reflected in our pathology or vice versa, uh, then that patient may need some further workup. Uh, we'd likely, uh, we would like him not to have gross uh, extra prosthetic extension or SV invasion. I think those patients are high risk and not a good candidate for something like Tulsa. Um, and also in terms of the reach from the urethra, it needs to about three centimeters. That's about as far as we can go uh, from the urethral applicator, which certainly um, has to be taken into account when you're looking at very peripheral lesions. There's also some anatomic considerations. Uh, patients who cannot fit within the MRI bore are not candidates for the procedure. Large calcifications can also present an issue because they can block the ultrasound beam or heat up too quickly, uh, preventing uh, kind of propagation of energy all the way out to the lesion at the periphery. Additionally, uh, we've also uh, used Tulsa in a few uh, salvage cases and fiducials and brachytherapy seeds and the location of these in relationship to the recurrent lesion within the prostate needs to be evaluated. On the clinical side, uh, I usually like to evaluate my patients to get their kind of lower urinary tract scores, uh, get some Euroflow, post residuals to see how much bother they have. This allows us to also concurrently treat BPH at the time of treating their cancer for those patients who, are, who have significant LUTs, as well as erectile function. This allows us to figure out, one, how close we can get to the nerve vascular bundles on the side of the lesion, and also allows us to have a kind of an informed discussion with the patient as to their risks and trade-offs of getting close to the nerve vascular bundles versus possibly leaving cancer behind. And finally, I kind of wrap it up with patients, uh, really talk about the side effects of the Tulsa procedure, the possible trade-offs, um, as well as the follow-up. Uh, I do tell patients that this is a more rigorous follow-up, uh, almost similar to active surveillance in the sense that they'll have prostate MRIs and PSAs, uh, which is different from surgery or radiation where it's just blood work. And I also talk to them again just to review that there are other options and how those compare to Tulsa. 
So here's uh, one of our sample patient cases. Uh, this patient is 60 year old at baseline. He's got a PSA of 10.6, uh, clinical T2. Uh, he's a 53cc prostate with a large PIRADS-5 uh, lesion of the right anterior transition zone. Um, and this came back on biopsy positive uh, for Gleason Greek group 2 disease at the right apex and mid uh, prostate. We had talked to him about kind of an anterior ablation uh, of his lesion uh, to spare the apical sphincter, the bilateral neurovascular bundles, the dactylar ducts, and bladder neck. He had uh, no issues with uh, erectile function on Viagra, or sorry, on Levitra. Um, and was very kind of uh, interested in preserving erectile function as best as possible. So to start off, uh, we start by inserting the endorectal cooling device within the rectum here. Uh, this allows us to cool the anterior surface of the rectum. Uh, we generally place the device in and then turn at 90 degrees to try to sweep any bubbles off the anterior surface of the rectum, which can introduce noise during the procedure itself. Following that, we set up a sterile field. Uh, you can see multiple people in, in the, the field here. There's the MR technologist. So this uh, starts by placing a Foley catheter within the patient. This is a council tip catheter to allow placement of a wire. Um, we also fill the bladder with 50 cc's of fluid just so we can visualize the bladder better on MRI. Uh, this is followed by the wire. Uh, this allows us to basically place the, it's a rigid urethral applicator that has the ultrasound elements within it. The wire helps us guide it and try to avoid false passages within the patient. Um, once the devices are both placed, once the robot is brought in and everything is set up, we hook the devices um, to the robot itself. Uh, the robot actually is what allows us to rotate the urethral applicator 360 degrees, also allows us to move the urethral applicator in and out uh, by a few centimeters to make sure we're optimally positioned. Thank you, Zhao Song. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Daniel Costa. I'm a radiologist here at uh, UT Southwestern. I've been working closely with urology for the past uh, 10 years uh, in prostate imaging, targeted biopsies, and more recently, uh, Tulsa procedures. Once the devices are in place, the next step is to verify that they are properly positioned. So here we see how we do that. We have a sagittal view of the pelvis where we can see the bladder, you can see the prostate, you can see the rectum, the urethral applicator, and the endorectal cooling device. Once that's done, we can uh, scroll through the images to review that the boundaries of the prostate are within the treatable volume, that circular green region of interest. And then we obtain thermometry baseline images where we're looking for how reliable the temperature monitoring information is. So uh, we double check that there is uh, not too much noise and that uh, the area that we want to ablate has good quality information. The next step is to actually draw the treat area to be treated. And you can see there that we are literally choosing which area to be treated in this patient. As uh, Zhao Song mentioned, this patient had a, uh, an anterior gland tumor. So we are focused on the two anterior thirds of the prostate. And uh, uh, the way we do is we do a rough uh, uh, drawing first, and then we use these higher quality axial tissue weighted images that gave us a, a good representation of the anatomy to fine tune and make sure that we are drawing this uh, treatment boundary as precisely as we can, making sure that we cover the tumor with a, a reasonable safety margin while staying away from things like the bladder wall, the nerves, the sphincter. Then it's the time to start the treatment. We can choose where we want to start. If you think about the prostate as a clock face and in which direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. So here uh, we started treating and you can see at the top, there are 12 thumbnails, uh, one for each of the 10 elements plus one below at the apex and one at the top at the base of the prostate. And uh, it's, extremely helpful to be able to see everything that is happening throughout the entire uh, prostate uh, as the treatment is being delivered. We can choose which element we want to focus on, but we have this overview of the entire gland. Uh, you can also see that we can pause the treatment and go back and watch 
what happened and whether what we intended to deliver was actually delivered either by reviewing the uh, current temperature in each pixel, the maximum temperature, or the so-called thermal dose map. So this is the uh, uh, actual treatment of uh, that uh, uh, same patient. Right at the top, you see the axial tissue weighted images that we use for uh, treatment planning. And uh, in yellow is outlined the area that we informed the system we wanted to ablate, so again, uh, primarily the two anterior thirds of the prostate staying far away from the neurovascular bundles. Uh, in, the, in the middle, you see the uh, current temperature. So uh, each color there represents a certain temperature range. And you can see that as the urethra applicator uh, moves, the temperature increases and uh, rapidly decreases. So that is the temperature that has been observed at that particular moment. And again, we're seeing this throughout the different levels of the prostate from the apex on the left to the base on the right. Uh, it's interesting to notice how the high temperatures shown in yellow are confined to the area that we prescribed uh, was the uh, area to be treated. Uh, this is a, a loop that is repeating, but uh, during the treatment, we did it twice. So we did uh, one pass and then a second pass where that index lesion was. At the bottom is another metric that we use, which is the maximum temperature that is showing what was the highest temperature that was ever achieved in each pixel. So it's, it's kind of a cumulative representation of the current temperature map. And like Daniel was saying, uh, this is one of the changes that we implemented since the TAC trial is we try to do at least a minimum of two sweeps through the area of the lesion um, to try to decrease any possible recurrence rates. Uh, sometimes we'll go back and kind of adjust margins um, and kind of bring out the margins a little bit more to make sure that as the prostate swells, we're getting good treatment uh, of the margin. This is uh, uh, at the bottom, we see a new set of images that are acquired at the end of the treatment. These are post-contrast images showing that the area that we wanted to treat uh, was in fact uh, adequately treated. You see that there is no enhancement uh, in an area that matches very well the uh, prescribed treat treatment area at the top. So showing a successful treatment. Also, you can see that there is a, a good sliver of a prostate that was preserved uh, and we never got anywhere close to the location of the neurovascular bundles. Yeah, and indeed for this patient, uh, he's actually undergone his one-year follow-up. Um, at his one-year follow-up, um, you know, his MRI was negative. Uh, his biopsy was also benign. We basically biopsy the area of the treated prostate as well as systematic biopsies uh, through the residual part of the prostate to verify that we didn't leave any kind of out-of-field recurrences as well. Um, and his uh, rectal function is at baseline uh, after this procedure. Um, the next case uh, is also, so about the majority of our patients are primary uh, prostate cancer patients, about less than 10% of these are their salvage uh, patients who've either undergone radiation in the past and had residual or recurrent disease within the prostate that's confined, uh, organ confined disease, or actually we have had a few patients who've had other uh, modalities such as FLA or transurethral hypothermia that have come back with residual prostate cancer that were treated. Um, as many patients, as many physicians who've treated these post uh, radiation salvage patients are aware, salvage prostatectomy is quite difficult in these patients. High risk of rectal injury, high risk of possible need for colostomy if there's a rectal injury, as well as really high rates of uh, urinary incontinence, almost 40 to 50 percent uh, in some patients, whether they'll have long term urinary incontinence. So. This uh, ablation method uh, with Tulsa and with some of the other methods really gives us a potential way to better treat these patients uh, and preserve quality of life. So here we can see similar images to that previous case. Uh, at the top, we see the area that we prescribed to be treated. So this was a right hemi ablation since uh, all the biopsy proven and the MRI visible uh, lesions were on that side. Uh, and uh, you can see in the middle, the maximum temperature map showing that we are achieving good temperature throughout that right hemi gland. Yeah, and in terms of, uh, thank you, Dan, in terms of his follow-up, 
Um, he's a year out from the procedure. His one-year MRI has been negative for recurrent disease. His PSA is actually undetectable. So uh, from here, after the treatment, uh, we'll take out all the devices, the urethral applicator. We'll take out the rectal cooling device. Uh, we'll then put a Foley catheter back in, and this is the catheter they'll go home with, uh, generally for 7 to 10 to 14 days, depending on the extent of our ablation. Uh, and then in terms of follow-up, um, you know, for us, if the MRI and biopsy are negative, we're doing Q six month PSAs and annual prostate MRIs. Uh, for guys uh, in our cohort who are on the captain trial, obviously they'll get an MRI and biopsy at the one year and two year mark. So uh, I just want to take a little bit of time, just kind of spend uh, a few minutes on kind of our experience so far. Um, so we think we've contributed three patients to the TAC trial at UT Southwestern. Um, since then, um, between a few physicians, uh, and as well as Dr. Costa, we've treated um, about 128 patients in total. Um, majority of these patients are primary. I think we've got 10 or 12 patients in here who are uh, salvage patients, a uh, mix of treatment options depending on the patient and their preference uh, from anywhere from focal to near whole gland. Uh, as we talked about earlier, we do at least two sweeps through each lesion and sometimes three or four is necessary to try to get the appropriate thermal dose to each lesion. Um, so far in our follow-up, we've had 39 patients undergo the one-year prostate MRI. Um, early in our cohort, everyone was mandated to get a prostate MRI, so we did lose a few patients early on um, in terms of biopsies, though our MRI rates are, are better. Um, you can see here the 45% decrease in prostate volume, 75% decrease in median PSA for the overall cohort. Obviously, this varies based on whether they had focal or near whole gland. Um, in terms of uh, recurrence rates uh, on repeat MRI, we've had eight patients that have had lesions seen on MRI. Um, these are pyoids greater than or equal to three. Uh, four of these are what we think of as marginal recurrences on the edges of our treatment, and four patients are out of field recurrences. Um, and Daniel and I have talked about this sometimes. I think patients do come in with outside MRIs uh, where we may not see lesions um, that we find later on, or these could be new lesions that pop up on imaging uh, during the year mark. Uh, not everyone has undergone biopsy, like we talked about. Some of the early patients uh, were not mandated to have biopsies. Um, and as once we started kind of mandating biopsies and MRIs at the one year mark, um, we've had a much better. Uh, patient compliance. Uh, 23 patients have undergone follow-up biopsy. Uh, we do have four patients with grade group two, um, all of them are less than or equal to three millimeters. Um, no patients have had upgrade on their biopsy after Tulsa, uh, as well as some uh, kind of very small bits of uh, tumor that were actually too small to grade by the pathologist and one Grayson grade group one. And uh, a few of these patients, uh, especially with the grade group two, have undergone repeat Tulsa. I think we've had three so far. Uh, the remaining patients have elected undergo active surveillance for now. Overall, I think our outcomes uh, in terms of functional outcomes are very similar to TACT. We've had uh, very low rates of true stress urinary incontinence, um, I'd say less than 2%, uh, and most of this is manageable in terms of one or two pads a day, um, as well as good maintenance of uh, potency in the guys who are potent pre-procedure. So uh, with that, uh, we just want to thank everyone for their time uh, and, and kind of hearing Daniel and I speak about our experience here. We just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to our Tulsa team. It's a big team. It's involving anesthesia, the MR techs, uh, as well as radiology and urology. We find it's a true collaboration here at UT Southwestern, and it really makes the experience, I think, uh, enjoyable for both of us. And I think it uh, help, really helps us take care of patients the best this way. Gentlemen, we thank you. Next up, we'll hop over to the Sunshine State and hear from Dr. Cianti with the Cianti Prostate Center. Welcome, Dr. Cianti. Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Cianti. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about Telsa Pro. I'm an ablative surgeon and have been doing prostate ablative therapies for over 20 years now. Uh, do a lot of work in my own center as well as provide direction to uh, Halo Diagnostics. I've used all the ablative technologies over the last 20 years, starting with MRI fusion guided uh, cryotherapy, which we currently offer. I have a very large experience with HIFU, have done some work with focal laser ablation, and certainly Tulsa is a welcome uh, addition to uh, my toolkit for treating uh, uh, prostate disease. What Tulsa gives me, though, is a very customized and patient centered approach 
allowing to treat a much wider uh, variety of patients than with some of the typical ablation technologies. TELS allows for truly a customized ablation. Patients really appreciate the shared decision-making approach where they can sit down with me and create a customized ablation plan based on their tumor location and based on their goals for functional uh, preservation. When we talk about focal therapy, particularly we have to talk about what's that patient's um, tolerance for outside of the field recurrence. And so if the patient really wants a, a, a more sure treatment, if you will, eliminating some of the, um, the uncertainty related to the diagnostics, we can treat a much larger field as we did in this particular patient. This patient had pre predominantly right-sided disease Luis in grade group two, seven of 12 cores positive. His MRI index lesion was in the right mid to base peripheral zone, uh, really from about the eight o'clock to the 10 o'clock uh, location. This gentleman had a total gland 360 degree rotation, but drawing the uh, prostate boundary uh, medially at the left neurovascular bundle area allowed it to limit energy around the left nerve bundle and allow for left nerve bundle preservation. Now, dose escalation was achieved in this patient by simply re-sweeping or retreating the location of that index tumor from the 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock position. So the patient had a beautiful oncologic treatment. He, received, he was able to achieve left neurovascular bundle preservation. And one of the principles of thermal ablation is dose escalation over the index lesion. We're able to achieve that uh, very nicely as well. Most of the patients uh, who are undergoing TELSA today in the United States have localized prostate cancer. And that's indicated by the little blue uh, figure. So the majority of patients have localized Gleason grade group 2, grade group 3 primarily um, prostate cancer. There is a subset of patients, however, who also have prostate cancer and significant uh, BPH with obstructive symptoms. And that's, that's a group of patients that um, typically may not be easily treatable with other ablative modalities. There certainly is a group of patients who have either failed radiation or other ablation technologies, and those make up about 10% of the patients who have had TELSA. And then there's a small group of patients, which I believe we'll see more of this in the future, who have simply obstructive BPH, very large prostate. They don't have cancer, but they've got highly symptomatic BPH. And the, uh, TELSA, pro the TELSA approach has been a beautiful approach because it gets nice ablation of the transition zone. Most of the ablation plans uh, have been either um, subtotal, um, or whole gland as opposed to simply focal. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of flexibility here. And so when we do a focal ablation particularly, I know that's a very hot topic and we have patients who clearly are excellent candidates for focal, but a lot of that depends upon the, our, our certainty about the diagnostic accuracy. And we can eliminate some of that diagnostic uncertainty by treating a much larger field. So by expanding the treatment zone, with excellent control of, uh, of energy and avoiding critical structures, we can get the patient a more reliable ablation. And so uh, the tremendous amount of flexibility is there from whole gland to subtotal and expanding with wider margin some of those focal patients, even going all the way out to hemi or hemi plus ablation. These larger prostates, well, emphasize this again, um, you know, become good candidates, but by increasing the ablation zone, the ablation region, we tend to see fewer out of field margin recurrences and the ability to offer a focal or subtotal approach, even with bilateral disease is increased. As a benefit, there's a relief of lower urinary tract symptoms as well. So there's three sweet spots we'll talk about for TELSA. The first real sweet spot for patients are the patients with uh, localized prostate cancer, grade group two or three. Those patients should consider TELSA as one of their standard treatment options. They may have either unifocal or diffuse bilateral disease, anterior or posterior locations, small or large volumes of tumor. Um, and, and there may be a role for with higher Gleason grades in a very select way, um, especially small Gleason grade group four patients we've included in our, in our treatment experience. Uh, it's important to exclude that uh, any evidence of extra prosthetic extension.
Some of the things that are important in screening, any larger calcifications will exclude patients. The tumor uh, calcifications greater than three millimeters will uh, block the beam path and certainly can't be positioned between the elements and so that will exclude patients. If the transverse a prostate uh, radius is greater than, um, or diameter is greater than 30 millimeters, um, then, you know, we have a, you know, the distance from the urethra to the capsule. If that exceeds 30 millimeters, then the beam won't reach beyond that area. So prostates that are 60 uh, millimeters across on diameter or 30 millimeters in radius, and particularly 30 millimeters from urethra to the most far-reaching uh, capsule region where tumor has to get to, uh, where tumor ablation has to occur. So distance is a concern, but this allows for a much larger treatment than a typical uh, ablation modality would say uh, cryotherapy or HIFU, for example. And uh, certainly if there's patients who have suspected extraprostatic disease, um, they're not going to be candidates. So pay attention to calcifications, pay attention to a radius greater than 30 millimeters and disease obviously beyond the prostate. Here's an example of a patient where the flexibility of Tulsa was very, very helpful. This patient had had um, a significant abdominal and rectal surgery previously. He had uh, surgical uh, clips uh, in the uh, region near the bladder. Uh, he had a lot of adhesions. He was considered a poor candidate for a radical prostatectomy. He did require a uh, total gland ablation. In this case, was able to perform a total gland ablation and spare the right neurovascular bundle. One of the technical issues that occurred is the large metallic clips were creating artifact uh, in the MRI, which was in interfering with the ability to measure temperatures properly or do MRI thermography. Simply by filling the bladder with more saline, the metallic clips were, were uh, elevated away from the, um, the zone uh, where now uh, good temperature readings were able to be achieved and the patient was able to have a very nice and successful procedure. He's had a beautiful PSA response to virtually non-detectable PSAs. The second sweet spot for Tulsa is select Gleason grade group one patients. So in general, Gleason grade group patients would be considered good candidates for active surveillance. But there are certain patients who are likely to fail surveillance. That is, they've got a high volume of disease, multiple cores, they've got a large MRI visible lesion, or particularly if they've got adverse uh, genomic parameters. Those patients are more likely to fail, and one can consider applying a treatment uh, to those patients because, again, the side effect profiles will be very favorable. There are active surveillance patients who have a very large prostate with bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms, and those patients become an ideal Tulsa patient as well because now we can certainly take away the risk that their prostate cancer may have uh, conveyed upon them, but very importantly, treat their symptomatic BPH. And then certainly as a subset of patients that just refuse active surveillance, and those patients can be offered Tulsa as well. Here's an example of a patient with a total gland ablation, Gleason grade group two, primarily in the right transition zone, but significant BPH, highly symptomatic uh, in a gland that was 75 cc's. At approximately um, you know, three months out, he had an excellent PSA reduction from 11 down to 0 0.23. He maintained good erectile function and his prostate symptom scores uh, were in the low, signal, low single digits with markedly improved uh, urinary function. The third sweet spot for Tulsa are patients who have uh, the need for a secondary treatment or salvage treatment uh, after either radiation or particularly other ablative technologies. Most of these patients will have grade group two or certainly grade group three disease, and that certainly is the sweet spot. One of the caveats is if they're large infield uh, nitinol or fiducial markers, those can affect the MRI's ability to measure temperature or thermometry and can certainly block ultrasound propagation, so that has to be looked at carefully. But very small gold fiducial markers usually can be positioned between the elements and that can be worked with quite well. So the opportunity here is to, um, in the future, maybe to offer Tulsa as part of a multimodality approach with either RT or ADT for very high risk disease or M0. That's still very experimental, but I think 
thinking about this is uh, thinking about TELS is part of a, um, um, a, a, a an important element of a multimodal therapy, maybe an opportunity for the future. One more comment about salvage therapies. Uh, over the years, I've had a lot of experience with this. I think it's important to evaluate those patients for candidacy for some type of subtotal uh, salvage therapy. The other comment I'll make about salvage is that the most significant Achilles heel of most ablation technologies for salvage, especially radiation recurrent, is the urethra. That urethra is highly sensitive after radiation therapy, sensitive to stricture, sensitive to um, uh, slough and destruction, and the 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 cooling of the urethral applicator is a big advantage in treating the radiation salvage patient with the TELSA technology. So in conclusion, TELSA provides the precision to safely ablate large volumes of prostate tissue when necessary, and I think really broadens the definition of ideal candidates for focal therapy. It allows for either a subtotal all the way up to whole gland ablation in men with focal or bilateral Gleason grade, grade, grade group two and grade group three cancers. And in select cases of higher grade group, especially with small welcome, well circumscribed lesions in the absence of extra prostatic extension. Additionally, in select grace and, uh, grade group one patients who will refuse or likely to fail surveillance. And again, patients who have prostate cancer with lower urinary tract symptoms, with obstructive BPH, this is a unique opportunity. It's one of the only technologies really that I know about to treat a very large prostate and cancer at the same time with one ablation technology. And certainly the emerging indication is for salvage ablation uh, with locally recurrent disease. Um, and, and again, those patients require proper evaluation, but this is an unmet need today, I think, uh, in, in urology. The future, uh, possibly is adding telsin as part of a multi-modality approach for disease bulk reduction primarily in men with very high risk or even stage M0 disease. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today. Um, but as you can see, uh, TELS is an incredibly flexible, very adaptive approach, which extend, extends greatly the uh, number of patients that can be treated with a minimally invasive ablative treatment. Thank you. Dr. Cianti, as always, thank you. Now, last but certainly not least, we will swing out west to Arizona and hear from Dr. Hong with Integrated Urology. Dr. Hong, welcome. Hi, my name is Dr. Mark Hong. I'm a practicing urologist in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am also a user of the Tulsa Pro. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you today to, uh, uh, for dedicating your time to uh, this presentation. Uh, certainly also wanna thank Profound and uh, the other audience members that we have today. Uh, you know, I, I am board certified, and uh, I should also mention that I am fellowship trained in robotic surgery and uh, am a high volume robotic prostatectomy surgeon. Just wanted to kind of uh, highlight that I spent a lot of time at the business school while at Stanford, uh, and I do think about kind of the micro uh, macroeconomic factors that might affect uh, decision making on adopting new technology in a practice. And that's going to be the aim of my talk today is to kind of talk about how do we adopt new technology and how does that impact our practices? Of course, specifically, we're talking about the Tulsa Pro technology and when is the time to adopt this technology in particular? Well, I think that you will come to see by the end of the pre uh, presentation that the time is now. Uh, one thing to just think about generally, let's let's go to you know Graduate School of Business 101. Uh, how do we adopt technology in any part of our lives? Well, in any new technology, there's something called the technology adoption curve. Uh, you see it here on the slide. Uh, essentially, there's an S-shaped curve. And uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, uh, that means that there's some kind of learning curve with uh, any new technology. Uh, but there's also a limit. And as more adopters start to use the technology, uh, more things get figured out, costs go down, more people adopt it, and then there's a natural life cycle where that uh, reaches its limit and uh, you don't really get further adoption. 
So this is the basic curve, but I will tell you that the way things work in a real society is that it's much more complicated. Uh, of course, as one new technology gets adopted, then uh, a competitor might come along, maybe a better version of that device. So you're going to rapidly see multiple technology curves that pop up once a new technology comes around. So how is this all relevant to us who are uh, mostly physicians in this audience today? I've been hearing this stuff for robotic prostatectomy and how we deal with prostate cancer for many, many years. Okay, so let's actually take ourselves back. Let's take ourselves back to the era of roughly the MP3. Okay, <laughs> basically, let's take us back to an era where um, uh, we dealt with prostatectomy by doing an open surgery. Okay, well, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. I can still remember that. Uh, you know, you make an incision, you do your prostatectomy, you hope that you don't get a lot of blood loss, uh, you still fear that uh, risk of incontinence, erectile dysfunction, uh, but of course, uh, 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 bladder and contracture, just stuff that, uh, you know, uh, it, it seems like a bygone era, but actually we used to think about this stuff. Well, think about what happened when the robot came in. And of course, I can clearly remember that the, let's say, uh, quote unquote old guard of surgeons. Uh, we're looking at the robotic surgeons saying that's crazy stuff. Why would you do that? You know, we already do such a good job with open prostatectomy. We cure cancer. Side effects are minimal. Uh, so uh, realistically, before the robotic era, you had laparoscopic prostatectomy uh, where you were getting very minimal blood loss. But guess what? Very technically challenging, right? So only the few and the best were actually able to do it. You know, the, the famous ones in France and elsewhere. But, you know, the truth is, it wasn't going to get adopted the way that robotic surgery ended up getting adopted. Why? Because it's just really hard to learn, really hard to get great outcomes, really hard to do that at scale. So the robot actually made that easier, right? The robotic surgery is just laparoscopic prostatectomy. It's just using a much easier interface, uh, better view, better control, all of the things that we know. Well, if you look at this slide, then you'll see that on the left side, uh, this is a, a published results of the adoption of robotic technology as it took over from open surgery. So that transition started happening, uh, you know, in the year 2006, 2007, 2008, and then suddenly 2009, it just dropped. You know, you saw open surgeries plummet uh, 2010 and beyond. You know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, uh, what uh, I believe it was Ernest Hemingway that said, uh, you know, uh, how did, uh, I think he went through personal bankruptcy, so he was talking about this and he's like, you know, how does that happen? Well, in the beginning, slowly, uh, and then suddenly. Well, this is kind of what we, uh, what we saw with robotic surgery, where it's like, no, that's just crazy stuff. And then suddenly, boom, everyone's doing robotics. And if you do open, you're not, uh, you're not keeping your market share in, in a community. Now, <clears throat> the, the key of all this stuff is how do we adopt technology as surgeons, especially? You know, how is it that we're going to evaluate technology? How do we know that it's valid? And how do we know that it's right for us as clinicians? First of all, you start with uh, what they call the innovators, the truly first adopters. They don't even call it the early adopters. They call it the innovators. That transitions uh, uh, into the early adopters, then the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. Okay, so uh, of course that that uh, rapid adoption is going to happen uh, right around the early majority, going into the late majority. But it's really the early, early adopters, the innovators that really drove the, the, the first recognition of this new technology. Well, let's just think for a sec. If we consider that 2.5% of uh, a user population are the innovators, uh, the early, early adopters, then uh, there were roughly 14,000 practicing urologists in the United States a few years ago. You know, 2.5% literally is just a few hundred of those people. So I actually want to commend you for being on this talk because just by virtue of you being on this virtual call with us, uh, you're, you're going to be considered an innovator, if not certainly an early adopter. And I think that's actually really important because uh, as this technology becomes known, it will be, uh, as you will see later, the data will be one where you cannot ignore this as even part of your informed consent. And I think that it's really important that you're starting to think about this right now. Uh, of course, you know, looking at the literature about how we as surgeons adopt new technology, I think it's kind of clear that, uh, one, number one, the safety has to be well established. It's got to be safe. You got to not mess up patients. Number two, you got to make sure that it actually improve, improves the quality of clinical care. What does that mean realistically? 
Well, in terms of prostate cancer, we're, we know the holy grail. That's the cure cancer, but also minimize the side effects, side effects such as incontinence and erectile dysfunction. And then not to mention a whole host of other outcomes such as you know, blood loss, uh, uh, return to work, time of catheter, all, all the kind of stuff that patients would care about. Well, then let's take a step back and put our lens on the current era, which is actually the robotic era of prostatectomy, which I think all of us can agree on this call that if you're talking about a surgical option, the robotic prostatectomy is considered the current standard of care. By the way, back in 1998, one might have said the open prostatectomy was considered the current standard of care. But in this era right now, we've now been doing robotics for over a decade, enough time to actually see what these long-term outcomes are, and therefore enough time for us to start looking back with the uh, retrospectometer and really start to think about what did we achieve here. Well, listen, this is openly published data uh, looking at uh, longer-term outcomes, uh, even prospective multi-center trial. Uh, you know, let me just kind of boil it down for you, because this is uh, on the slides on the right side. We we can clearly see from multiple sites, I know each, each surgeon thinks that their outcomes are superior to other surgeons in their area, but let's just be kind of generally speaking here. Uh, certainly we've done a great job of curing cancer. I think that's not debatable. Uh, in general, cure rates are very, very high. But let's look at continents, okay? If we actually compare open data, which is the orange curve that you see on the right side, on, on graph A on the right uh, slide there, uh, versus the blue uh, curves, which are the robotic data, uh, you'll see exactly what we generally see with prostatectomy, which is uh, worsening of incontinence immediately post-op, and then it gets better over time. But as you can see on both curves, the incontinence is never coming back to 100%, 100% or 100 on the domain score in this case. So that does imply that you're gonna have some long-term incontinence for out to at least two years. And we all know that if you're incontinent at two years, likely you'll be incontinent beyond that point. Uh, even worse are the sexual domain scores. So uh, as we know uh, on slide D of the right side of the, the, the slide you see there, uh, look, first of all, not all men at this age group are starting with 100% sexual uh, function. So we acknowledge that uh, there could be different return of function depending on where you start. But clearly, all men take a hit immediately after prostatectomy. Now, you can argue, uh, you can see the separation of these slides on, uh, on D. And the reason there is separation is because it, it turns out that nerve sparing or non sparing actually makes a difference. If you remember, there actually used to be an era where uh, even during open surgery, we would talk about how, oh, does that nerve sparing thing, is that real for, for or not? Well, you can see the data, okay? In open nerve sparing, clearly there was an improvement in sexual domains versus non-nerve sparing and also for robotic surgery. But what you see is that the data is tracking each, uh, itself in each category pretty closely, meaning that it doesn't really seem, at least according to this data, that open surgery or robotic surgery makes much of a difference in terms of both continence or incontinence, I should say, and long-term sexual function, meaning primarily erectile dysfunction. Uh, so, and, and by the way, nurse spring does, uh, does help to some degree, but it's also not like nurse spring makes a difference between um, uh, uh, being fully erect versus not after, after prostatectomy. So if you believe these results, then I think uh, one of the conclusions we can start to at least question ourselves is what did we really achieve in the robotic surgery era? Well, certainly uh, you can make other arguments for uh, loss of uh, you know, blood loss during the procedure, time of hospitalization, uh, recovery uh, from uh, you know, to normal activities, all, all great metrics, all things that are very important to the patient. But I'll tell you, if you have that long-term incontinent patient or impotent patient, and believe me, we all have them, then the, that data is all relative to the fact that they're having to wear a diaper or that they're not able to perform maybe to their expectation. So I think we can all uh, basically just say that if technology could fill that void between the gaps of quality of life and outcomes that we get from the robotic era, robotic prostatectomy, versus obviously driving the uh, the uh, movement to uh, active surveillance where we uh, should be watching everyone with uh, low-grade disease and, and that, that movement. But again, why is that? Because our, we're causing harm from the treatments that we do. If we can bridge that gap, then that would be a pretty amazing technology. 
Well, uh, guess what? That technology is actually available to us today. We're now at a point where Tulsa Pro is sort of ready for prime time, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, there are many things that will drive the adoption of this technology, both technical aspects and aspects that go out of, of uh, kind of uh, uh, just what we do as clinicians, uh, even at a higher level, uh, regulatory, all those things. But bottom line is, you need to have a strong program to adopt this technology, okay? You, you basically uh, want to be very involved in doing prostate work. Uh, whether it's BPH or prostate cancer or both, I suspect most of us uh, that do prostate work do both. Uh, uh, meaning that if you're primarily a, uh, let's just say, incontinence focused practice or uh, kidney stones and you rarely deal with uh, prostate cancer, maybe you don't do pr prostatectomy, well, listen, then uh, maybe the path towards Cells Pro is referring to the high volume people who do that, just the same as you may not have wanted to learn how to do a robotic prostatectomy, but certainly we're open to sending your patients to those who do, did them well, okay? Uh, it's all the same diagnostics uh, that we already do with PSA. You can certainly put in biomarkers in there, rectal exam, but what's important is to have good MRI imaging, so high quality images and high quality reads, right? Uh, and that's local to your community. Uh, uh, I do personally believe that the MRI fusion biopsy, therefore, uh, whether it's transrectal, transperitoneal, uh, that, that's a uh, different debate. But bottom line is some kind of targeted biopsy is important to really know exactly how to treat with Tulsa Pro. Because if you can localize that treatment, and I've personally had guys who have told me that they would rather risk not curing their cancer than getting erectile dysfunction. So guess what then? You can go super focal on that kind of therapy and they just understand that in the future they might need another treatment, whether it's another Tulsa Pro or maybe a prostatectomy at that time. Now, uh, of course, every step along that pathway, you do want to optimize the patient experience, uh, make sure that imaging is, is done in a timely fashion, in a comfortable fashion, uh, the scheduling of those things, doing biopsies, and, and how we counsel them. Why, why do we believe that the time is now for this uh, uh, technology? Well, I will tell you, listen, I've personally been doing Tulsa Pros for a while now, so the, the technology itself is is the same amazing technology that I started doing it. But I think what's changing is some of the higher level stuff. Uh, so uh, we've seen now with the CPT code, uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, the path to uh, insurance uh, coverage uh, is going to really uh, drive uh, the, the rapid adoption, uh, the, the really almost vertical shaped curve, similar to what we saw with robotic surgery. Uh, having said that, you know, uh, I also think as careful surgeons, we're constantly looking for reassurance that this is safe, this is effective, it does what it's supposed to do without causing other problems. I think we're already seeing that, the five-year TAC trial, I think is uh, is believable because I can see my outcomes tracking at least what the TAC trial shows. And I think our uh, uh, what we will likely find is that real-world data, uh, meaning what happens in practices that are outside of the clinical trial setting, may actually show even better results only because, again, the rigid nature of clinical trials and the uh, inclusion uh, exclusion criteria. Uh, but I think in the least, we can show that based on the current data that is widely available at this time, that the Tulsa Pro is just a natural progression in the continuum of care that we have for prostate cancer. And if we fold into that, the advanced imaging that's going to even get better and better in terms of MRI technology, then I think it's just fair to say that how is it possible that anyone is going to be able to do an informed consent for the treatment of prostate cancer without including the Tulsa Pro option? I think that's going to actually be uh, more and more a part of our guideline discussions and all those things. I certainly understand we're still in that innovator early adoption phase, but uh, clearly the data cannot be ignored. Uh, now, what's going to really blow it open as well is going to be uh, the trial data, a head-to-head -head trial, Tulsa Pro versus robotic prostatectomy. Again, kind of unprecedented stuff. You just don't see trials like that being done. Um, the, the last point I'm going to make here is that I believe that the, uh, the, the part of the, the adoption curve that uh, we didn't show and doesn't really get even talked about in business school, so to speak, is um, the catalyst, okay? We actually remember maybe from uh, biochemistry, if you remember the activation curve uh, for getting a chemical reaction to happen, well, guess what? It looks just like the adoption curve, okay? If you want to go from you know compound A to compound B, well, you have this activation energy and it, and it requires that to to basically uh, uh, overcome that activation energy. Well, I would say in our world, that's maybe inertia, okay? The urologist is very comfortable doing prostatectomy, so even if data looks great, you know what, do I really wanna learn, invest in a new technology? Do I think it's safe? All that kind of stuff. 
Well, I think that we're going to need catalysts, okay? We're going to need people like myself and other like-minded surgeons, radiologists, treating physicians who really believe in the results that they've already seen in their own practices, but then also are also seeing in well-published, well-reviewed literature. <laughs> and the catalyst is going to be, how do we make this simpler, easier to adopt? Uh, uh, how do we make the MR technology uh, more accessible so that urologists are not intimidated by that, but also know how to use it to its fullest extent? Uh, these are all the things that I'm personally... Uh, you know, really dedicated to making sure that we reduce that activation energy, that we are the catalyst that then help to drive adoption. I would say the real goal here is perfect outcomes, cancer control uh, uh, without the side effects, the holy grail that we've all been looking for. I do believe we're well on that path with the Tulsa Pro technology. I wanted to thank you for your time and uh, certainly uh, uh, I'm looking forward to your questions as well.